Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Another round of storms in what has already been a very busy weather week. Parts of the Hill Country dealing with the storms popping up this afternoon. Adam Kasky has his eyes on the radar and joins us with a quick look at your forecast. Adam. Yeah, and Katie Blake here is, is here as well. She's tracking the storms and we've got the latest info for you. So let's get right to the radar display and you'll see off to the west. We have some stronger storms closer to the border. That's Southern Kinney County, Northern Maverick County, and they are pushing southward with that warning extending into Northern Maverick County. They could have some wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour and some large hail there and even Northwestern Kinney County, some large hail that would be closer to Brackettville as it continues to push eastward and then elsewhere uh, into San Antonio. We do have a severe thunderstorm warning that's in effect and that severe thunderstorm warning is for a hail core that is basically along the north side of town. So we look at the uh, radar there and it's basically moving along 1604 at the moment and right along 1604. There's the path and what we can expect with it, making it to Hollywood Park. Well, the strongest part of it moving into Hollywood Park momentarily. Uh, Hill Country Village at about 608, so momentarily, and you get to Wetmore at about 621. So that's the hail core within it. Could be some one inch size hail, but this is nothing like what we saw last night right now. Just one isolated, stronger storm. Are you concerned about flooding? Yes, because these are moving more slowly, but they're also not as widespread. Okay, great. New at six millions of dollars planned for Bear County. It's all part of a plan as the state prepares for a settlement in an opioid lawsuit. Some of the drug companies are ready to settle. So the state announced a plan centered around how Texas will direct future settlement money to people most impacted from the opioid epidemic. That plan would include about $75 million for Bear County. Attorney Michael Watts represented Bear County in the case tonight on the night beat. A one on one interview with Watts and what he is revealing about the case and the money coming to San Antonio. We are learning more about a man who was shot and killed, who shot and killed himself rather Sunday as deputies tried to take him into custody in far northeast Bear County. 26 year old Sean Thomas Kelly behind the wheel of a stolen car, according to sheriff's officials. Dylan Collier with more on Kelly's past. Sean Thomas Kelly only ever faced a single criminal charge in Bear County, felony theft. But court records show he had a lot of trouble getting past it, repeatedly getting dragged into jail and then court for probation violations. In early 2015, San Antonio police responding to this storage facility on Nacogdoches Road found a trailer with its door pried open and thousands of dollars worth of construction equipment missing from inside. Months later, Kelly was taken into custody for the crime. After pleading no contest, Kelly was accused of a long list of violations that put him back in custody three more times. A neighbor told KSAT off camera today, Kelly eventually moved to California and after coming back to San Antonio, appeared to be in a better place. It certainly sounds like he was in a desperate situation himself. That narrative is not in line with descriptions of the scene Sunday provided by Sheriff Javier Salazar, who said Kelly ran from deputies through people's yards wearing only boxer shorts and boots before jumping a fence along FM 78 and turning a handgun on himself. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The defenders have requested dash camera and body worn camera footage of the incident, but have so far not heard back on whether it will actually be released. A motorist accused of driving drunk and killing a former high school cheerleader has lost his bid to have his bond reduced. Eric Gassas remains jailed. His bond set at a quarter of a million dollars. Paul Venema takes us to the scene that night and to today's bond reduction hearing, which was held remotely. This crash last winter claimed the life of 19-year-old Jasmine Claire Godot. She was a former cheerleader at Warren High School who graduated in 2019. A pickup truck driven by 29-year-old Eric Casas slammed broadside into the driver's side of her SUV. Godot was rushed to the hospital but was dead on arrival. Investigating officers suspected Casas was intoxicated and he was booked on intoxication manslaughter charges. The state of 
Texas versus Eric Casas. During this bond reduction hearing, Casas, testifying from jail, explained that he was trying to generate enough cash to make the $250,000 bond set on the night he was arrested. Are there any family members that could help you uh, accumulate resources to pay off a bond? Yes, sir. Who's that? My parents are going, my brothers as well. His lawyer asked Judge Velia Meza to reduce Casas' bond to $100,000. After hearing oral arguments from both sides, the state asking that the motion to reduce bond be denied, Judge Meza ordered that the $250,000 bond remain in place. No trial date was set. Due to the court's shutdown over fears of the spread of the coronavirus, the case will likely not be tried for for several months. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Well, the city is facing a nearly $200 million hole in its budget. Revenues from sales tax, hotel occupancy tax, and the airport have all been affected by the pandemic. The city manager said they've already taken steps like furloughing employees and suspending some programs to help offset that loss. The city staff now recommends adding money for one of them back in. We've added a little bit of money back in to uh, be able to support the opening of pools under a safer provision uh, and in accordance with public health guidelines because uh, we know there's going to be a need this summer. City staff are also recommending the city abate or delay rent payments for businesses at the airport and other properties it owns. City Council is scheduled to approve adjustments to the budget next week. Time saver traffic right now, a trans guide camera at I-10 West and Loop 1604, giving you an idea of just the conditions out there more than anything else. No major traffic trouble spots to tell you about, but again, you can see the rain coming down at I-10 West at Loop 1604. Well, it is baby season, the time of year when wildlife experts say every species native to our area is having their young. But many of the baby birds may have fallen to the ground, blown out of their nests by our stormy weather. So what do you do if you find one or any baby wildlife you think needs help? Jesse Degriotta reports an act of kindness may actually lessen the chance of survival. Not all baby birds are as lucky as this Carolina Wren family. They were in the flower pot where their parents had built the nest. These baby cardinals had fallen out of their nest, but they were placed by the person who found them in a shoebox with shredded paper that was then securely placed back in the tree. Even though they'd been re-nested, the cardinal parents came back. 95% of the time they do, and that is true of squirrels, and baby birds who often do get blown out of the trees. Yet she cautions against trying to take care of them at home. We cannot give them absolutely everything the mother gives them. It's simply not humanly possible. Like any baby wildlife, like this little cottontail, they're found when their shallow nests in the ground are run over by lawnmowers. The mother lines it with her fur. So you will see some fur, that's the mother's fur. Just put the babies back. Released from its refuge in Candelia, these fawns, they say, weren't necessarily abandoned. If you simply find a fawn who's sleeping somewhere curled up, leave him alone. Their mothers spend hours foraging for food. Wildlife, she says, doesn't leave its young behind without a reason. Nobody wants to lose their child. And that is simply true of wildlife as well. Their mothers are devoted to them. They are devoted to their mothers. They need each other. Let's leave them together. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. We just had a baby bird fall off a tree at our Very house the other day. Yeah. yeah, we have more information on our website, KSAT.com, about what you should and shouldn't do if you find baby wildlife that you think needs help. After last night's big storms, insurance claims are now pouring in. It hammered the roof pretty good. We just got a roof about three years ago, so I called State Farm, and they're going to come up here and take a look at it. Bill and Patty Centeno's Churchill Estates home took a pounding in the storms. Three trees came toppling down, creating quite the cleanup job. Insurers were kept busy with customers filing claims for wind and hail damage to their homes and their cars. USAA alone had more than 4,000 claims by mid-afternoon. They encouraged people to use the app or website to file because it's more efficient. We actually have gone to, through the COVID crisis, gone to a lot of virtual estimating. And uh, we can do it all online through photos and 
uh, digitally. If you have storm damage, insurers suggest you contact your carrier immediately, make temporary repairs to prevent further damage, hang on to receipts, and be especially wary of fraudulent repair people who seem to, came, to, who seem to come out of the woodwork after a major storm. Take a live look outside with live cam and uh, that pretty much tells the story yeah. off in the distance. But you know, I really, some of the people like in Kerrville, mm -hmm. And some of the areas that are hit especially hard last night, feeling it again today. Yeah. Just maybe not as severe, but they're getting more rain. Yeah, we are getting more rainfall. Kerrville had a lot more rain and even some large hail. I mean, Ingram had hail an inch and a half in diameter. This is the north side of San Antonio right now. The severe thunderstorm warning has been dropped. Maybe some pea size hail mixed in here, possibly a dime size hail, but that's about it. So this is a non severe thunderstorm that is moving through town. You can see it has weakened over the past you know, 30 minutes, especially there. It weakened quite a bit. Just some good rain for some of the northern communities. A full update on the forecast coming up. We are standing by right now for our daily city county briefing with the mayor and county judge. Let's go ahead and uh, get ready to listen in. Okay. I'm Mayor Ron Nuremberg with Mayor County Judge Nelson Wolf, and we're joined tonight by Dr. Don Emmerich, our Director of Metropolitan Health. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we are confirming 2,583 cases of COVID-19 in Bear County. This is an increase from yesterday of 58. 17 of those cases are from the community, two are from additional congregate facilities, and 39 are pending determination. We do have another death, unfortunately, to report tonight, and that brings our, our total to 71 since this crisis began. The individual who passed away was a black male in his 60s and passed away at Methodist hospital. Please keep them in your prayers. Um, I do want to spend a moment to talk about our hospital numbers because we've been seeing a gradual increase in the total number of COVID positive patients in the hospital. And you can see that graph there. The important thing to note on this graph, and we are watching it very closely, is that it's one indicator of several that we're using to determine where we are in the containment of this disease. Um, this line has always, uh, from the start to where we are now, fallen well within our strength numbers in terms of maintaining hospital capacity. That's the good news. Bad news is that we're seeing a gradual uptick, so that we're watching it very closely. Want to note on this number here, we see now 95 cases of positive patients, uh, positive for COVID in our local hospital tonight. That is up from three, up three from yesterday, and, and again, a gradual increase over the last few days. 41 of those patients are in intensive care. That's up two, and 22 are on ventilators. We do have, as I said, capacity strong in our hospitals still. 79% uh, of our ventilators are available, and 31% of our staffed hospital beds are available. And so the hospital system itself continues to be in stable condition, and that's what we do want to see. I'll turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks, Mayor. Uh, yeah, that is a concern on the hospitals. Uh, I think it is important to say that most of them are moderately ill, and hopefully they will get okay. But 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 it is a uh, something that we need to really stay stay on stay on top of. Uh, we're doing pretty darn good at the jail now. Uh, we've only got two people in the infirmary now, where we were running around 14 or 15. We have none in the hospital. So uh, the jail situation is looking much better, except for the fact that we have 335 inmates that should have been taken by the prison system now. They, those 35 cost us about $20,000 a day. So uh, if you're a local taxpayer, uh, bring some pressure on your state representatives for them to be stepping up and taking the prisoners that they should take. Uh, they've pushed our uh, total now to 3,400 uh, cases, and it's a big burden on uh, the county and a big burden on local taxpayers because the state's not stepping up to do what they're doing, what they should be doing. Uh, well, I guess I have to tell you where I'm having lunch today. I had lunch today at Meteor. I'm trying to go to places that are locally owned by the Cortez family, um, doing everything right. Uh, they were only seeing 50 percent, which is all they can do, but I had to wait about 20 minutes just to get to a table. So, People are getting back in there and they are getting out to eat and I think that's good as long, as long 
as they uh, are using the face mask and staying uh, six foot apart. Uh, we have been distributing uh, 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 the, the uh, personal protective equipment to businesses through a lot of our local cities. As you know, we got 26 uh, suburban cities, about uh, probably 250,000, maybe 280,000 live in those cities. So each city now is distribu uh, distri helping us distribute these things. We're also going to be working with them on Wi-Fi, and uh, they've been a big plus to us. I think they've distributed now over five or 600 uh, kits to local businesses. So uh, let's just be careful out there. Let's not muff up what we're doing here by taking chances we shouldn't be taking and getting ourselves back in trouble. Now, let's stay on course. Thank you very much, Judge. Yeah. And I do want to note that as we discuss, discussed last week, there has been an outpouring of support and volunteerism within this community. We've heard from many individuals who have uh, some funds that they would like to contribute to those in need, especially those who have been out of work and um, you know haven't been, within, been without paychecks. So we do want to give you the web address for the COVID-19 response fund la uh, that we talked about last week. The web address for that United Way website is help satx.org. You can click donate, and uh, you can also donate by by texting help satx to 41444. Um, money is being distributed twice a week to nonprofits who are on the front lines, and we hope that many of you will support this emergency relief fund that are uh, helping those uh, in desperate need in Bear County and the surrounding counties. We also want to point out that there's an easy way to find out who needs help and exactly what type of help they need through a new website that was created by the United Way as well, which takes you directly to virtually every nonprofit in town through one uh, particular website. It's called San Antonio. United for Good, and the website to that um, uh, facility is saunitedforgood.org. On that website, you can sign up uh, to volunteer, you can make a donation, or sign up to provide, provide needed items to causes that matter to you most, and you can do that directly without any fees associated. Finally, I do want to say that uh, one of the industries that has been hardest hit during this crisis is our hospitality industry, especially those who are working in local hotels and restaurants. And so uh, we want to note uh, that the United Way has been focused uh, particularly in this area, and the entire community has been as well. And there is a new initiative called the Get Shift Done for San Antonio Initiative. I'm not making that up, that's the name, uh, but that's helping people in San Antonio and Bear County and the surrounding communities to provide wages for hourly workers who in turn provide volunteer shifts at local nonprofit organizations that are preparing, serving, or delivering food to areas, our area's children, elderly, and individuals or families in need. Workers prepare and assemble and, and provide food service meals at a livable wage. And so you can go to that website and contribute and learn more about it at getshiftdone.org slash San Antonio. You see that URL on your screen. Finally, as you can, as you uh, know, you can get the latest on COVID-19 at any time by texting COSAGOV to 55000, or you can go to the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov. We've got Dr. Emmerich here, the judge and myself. On behalf All right, I'm glad I didn't have to say what that website yes. is. Yes, there is an S -H -I -F -T. in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the number's up 58, 2,583. Uh, unfortunately, one more death to report in the last 24 hours. Uh, and the, the mayor and the judge paying very close attention to the number of patients who are in area hospitals because as of late, that seems to be trending up. Yeah, still a strong capacity, as he mentioned there at the hospitals. The judge also talked about the situation at the jail. It is looking better, he said. Um, only two inmates right now currently in the infirm infirmary, which is uh, certainly good news. He also mentioned that they're still awaiting the transfer of about 335 yeah. inmates, which is costing taxpayers quite a bit of money when you break that down, awaiting transfer to TDCJ because they're just not accepting inmates from other uh, facilities at this point in time. Yeah, and if you had me, Tierra, in the where the county judge ate today pool, congratulations. All right, let's switch to the weather situation because it is, seems to be changing a little bit as I look at the radar, Adam and Katie. 
Yeah, luckily the storms over San Antonio have really fizzled out quite a bit. Now it's just some good rainfall left over. Yeah, we do have uh, our web team is telling me we have over 12,000 people without power. So as they moved in, they were kind of intense. That may have knocked out power for some of our uh, residents there, but they're really fizzling out now. Yeah, and that was mainly because of lightning. So let's get to our radar system and take a look at some severe weather off to the west of town. That's where we have severe thunderstorm warning. Southern Kinney County, Northern Maverick County. You can see some big hail within some of these storms, especially as you get a little closer to the border there. You can see that south movement to those storms. Then you get into the San Antonio area and we're looking at just some rain that has really fizzled out and really a crack or two of thunder and that's about it. I mean, we're not really expecting much more than that. So switch over to the local radar and there you see it over the past hour, how you had that really defined area of rain with a lot of lightning and now it's basically shrunken down to just about nothing. So really our threat we think has passed now for San Antonio. That's the way it looks. And once all this activity moves out of here, we're in the clear for the rest of the night. That's the nice thing. Uh, whereas uh, off to the west, we still have that storm chance for the next couple of hours along the border. All right, for the full forecast, let's go over to Katie. Yeah, look at your Friday. It's really not going to be too bad. We'll be warm in the afternoon. High temperature around 91, but north northeast wind will help to drop our dew points a bit, so it won't be overly muggy to finish out the day tomorrow. And how about that? No chance of rain tomorrow. No chance of rain through the weekend, so we'll get a little break here. Everyone can kind of catch their breath. If you've got a little cleanup to do, you'll have pleasant weather the next couple of days to do that. It'll certainly be warm. We are uh, rapidly approaching June here, but not overly hot as we head into the weekend. So a break from rain chances until early next week, guys. Thank you, Katie. All right, let's switch to sports now and some postponements, Absolutely. cancellations still ongoing in the yeah, especially when it comes to Tim Duncan's Hall of Fame ceremony that was scheduled for August. When will it be scheduled now? It has been officially postponed. We'll have details on that. And J.J. Watt reacting to the death of a former Houston resident, George Floyd, in Minneapolis coming up. The induction of Spurs great Tim Duncan into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame has been postponed until the spring of 2021 due to the coronavirus. That's according to Basketball Hall of Fame Chairman Jerry Colangelo through ESPN, who says the enshrinement ceremony in Springfield, Massachusetts, originally scheduled for August the 29th, now will be moved until the spring of next year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Among those also being inducted in the class of 2020 is late Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, Rudy Tomjanovich, Baders Kim Mulkey, and three others, including college basketball legend Eddie Sutton, who just passed away this past week. Yeah. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. George Floyd, who died while in police custody in Minneapolis, actually grew up in Houston before making the move to Minnesota to start a better life for himself. By now, most of us have seen the gut wrenching video of Floyd telling officers he can't breathe and later die. Turns out Floyd grew up in the third ward of Houston, where he met former Spurs Steven Jackson and became a star player for the Yates football team. During his meeting with media via Zoom, Houston's most respected athlete, J.J. Watt, was asked for his reaction to the Houston native who was killed by police. To me, it doesn't make any sense. I just don't see how a man in handcuffs on the ground who is clearly detained and clearly saying in distress, I don't understand how that situation can't be remedied in a way that doesn't end in his death. Um, I think it's, I think that it needs to be addressed strongly, obviously. Um, and I think I just, I don't see how that situation makes any sense whatsoever. Former Spurs Steven Jackson, who helped the Silver and Black win their title in 2003, says he and Floyd looked so much alike growing up, they were called twins, telling their sister station KPRC in Houston that he screamed when he saw the video scaring his daughter. Watt has two years remaining on his contract with the Texans right now. None of that money, $15.5 million this year coming and $17.5 million next year, are guaranteed. So he was asked, how important is it to him to end his NFL career in Houston? That would be obviously uh, a goal of mine. I mean, this city has been incredible to me since the day I got here. I'm very thankful and fortunate uh, to have the opportunity to play for such great fans and have supported not only myself, my foundation, and everything that I've tried to accomplish. So uh, it's a great place. I certainly hope that's the case. In the meantime, the Dallas Cowboys are now just days away from their decision on whether or not they will hold their annual training camp in Oxnard, California, or Frisco, Texas. Earlier, the Cowboys have told us they needed to know something by June 1st in order to make a decision on if they would go camping in California or had to stay at home at the start due to the coronavirus outbreak. So during a conference call with reporters, new head coach Mike McCarthy was asked if the Cowboys are any closer to making that call for camp set to begin July 21st. 
the, the, the next step for for me personally, and coaching staff, is when, when we're going to be able to get back and in, you know into our facility. So um, I, I don't see a decision on training camp happening before that. You know, I, I clearly understand uh, what training camp needs to look like, and and I just got to make sure we're ready to do it at either Oxnard or Frisco. The new pass interference review rule is done because NFL Vice President Troy Vincent says it failed miserably. It was born out of the missed pass interference call in the 2019 NFC Championship game. It cost the New Orleans Saints a trip to the Super Bowl, but it struggled in trying to determine what was a reasonable mistake on the field. In the end, the one-year experiment is now over. And here's hoping Cowboys go to California. <laughs> we'll see. I bet you want to. Yes, I, yes, I do. Thank you, Greg. All right, Gordon Hartman from Morgan's Wonderland talking live about his decision to close for the season when we come back. All right, this is the segment where we call coronavirus Q&A, where we get to ask some local experts about what's going on with the coronavirus in their particular industries, in their communities, in their occupations. We are very pleased to be joined by the man who really started Morgan's Wonderland and so such great memories that have already been made there and will be made there. Gordon Hartman joins us. Uh, Gordon, thank you for joining us. How tough a decision was this for you? Uh, probably one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make. Um, we've been talking about this for about a month, knowing that we would have to come to a decision and we talked to a lot of people, we had a lot of meetings, and there was just no way we could determine uh, a structure to where we could ultimately be who we are and remain open. You know, Mortgage Wonderland is ultra accessible, fully inclusive, meaning that everybody is always welcome, no matter uh, what their need may be, their special need may be, and it's open for everybody to enjoy. And so trying to think of some way we could do that to where no matter how acute someone's special need may be, playing alongside someone who does not have a special need, how could we handle that? And there just was no way to do it. Uh, we could cut off certain parts of the park, we could make changes, but that wouldn't be who we are. And so ultimately we made a decision we simply had to close for 2020. Now, Mr. Hartman, we mentioned in our report during the five o'clock news that you are planning some other events at Morgan's Wonderland. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, what we're doing is uh, we can't do the normal rides and all the activities on the 25 acres that we currently have. That would not be possible. You know, we have some 26 different attractions. What we can do, though, is potentially have uh, plays at our amphitheater, uh, other activities, our new uh, Morgan's Wonderland sports facility to do possibly outdoor movies and things like that. There's a lot of other things that are being thought through right now. But we'll do them when we know that we can allow 100 percent everybody uh, those who have special needs and those who don't to come together and enjoy an evening or an activity during the day. But it has to be safe and it has to be where we don't put anybody in arm's way. And we'll come up with those things. Uh, we just have to work through some details right now. But th there'll be announcements soon as to some of the things that we can do to still ensure people an opportunity to be a part of Morgan's Wonderland and Morgan's Inspiration Island and everything else that we do. And obviously your daughter Morgan is the big inspiration behind everything that you do. Uh, what has this coronavirus pandemic been like for the special needs community? It's been, well, every situation is different. Uh, for those who may have cognitive delays, um, sometimes there's a, a, not a true understanding of why they can't do some of the things they're used to doing. And that sometimes causes other issues, uh, anxiety, um, uh, other things that may be acted out, et cetera. Uh, I'm very proud of Morgan, how well she's handled uh, the last two months. Uh, and then also those with physical special needs who are used to doing activities with others uh, as well, who can't do some of the things that uh, they, they normally are used to doing. So it's, it's brought about a lot of tough situations. And also it's made it um, much tougher for a lot of the caregivers who have had to rearrange the way they do things, parents, uh, grandparents, those who are employers for those who care for those with special needs. So, uh, this pandemic has, has really turned uh, the regular routine, if you will, for those with special needs upside down. But I have to tell you, you know, special needs uh, individuals and families and everybody involved, they have a way of dealing with this in a very positive way. And I have talked to so many parents and so many people and, you know, they know that this is a little bit of a rough patch, but we'll get through it. And 
you know, after the announcement was made this morning, how many people reached out to us and said, you know, we really wanted Morgan's Wonderland to be open, but we understand. And it's that type of attitude, I think, guys, that is really making a difference and will bring us back stronger uh, next year when we reopen. Yeah, and speaking of that, uh, Mr. Hartman, you know, everything is still very fluid. No one knows exactly when we're going to be out of this pandemic. But when you are ready to reopen, what will that look like? And do you have a target date in mind? Well, like you said, uh, we don't know exactly when we're going to get our arms around this thing. Uh, my hope is, is that we will open early next year um, uh, in late February, early March. Uh, if things are under control better, maybe we'll open a little earlier next year since we had to close this year. We don't know that yet. And, and in respect to how things will be different, um, that is still probably something that needs some more discussion. Uh, I don't think there will be drastic changes. I think there will have to be some changes, but we'll have to give that some, some thought and some, uh, some, get some advice from some really good people. You know, we have a lot of people who are involved very intimately in respect to how we do things and why we do what we do. Uh, they are going to be involved from this day forward until we open to make sure we get it right. We just don't know when that's going to be right now. And that's okay. We'll get through this. We'll be stronger for it. But uh, these things happen, and we have to take them one day at a time right now. Gordon Hartman okay, with Morgan's Wonderland and, of course, the Hartman Family Foundation. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll have another conversation at 9 and then again on the night beat at 10. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. We'll be right back. Southwest Airlines has all the buzz, it seems, with travelers for 2020. According to a J.D. Power survey of 10,000 business and leisure travelers, Southwest had the highest satisfaction levels in a number of categories, including baggage handling, boarding, check-in, costs, and crew. The survey covered both short-haul and long-haul flights, and Southwest was on top in both categories. Yeah, JetBlue finished second in both, Delta third in long-haul, and Alaska Airlines took third place for shorter flights. Before the pandemic, J.D. Power says overall customer satisfaction scores were the highest they'd ever recorded. A survey conducted in mid-April shows what air travelers valued the most. Regular updates on safety and sanitization measures. Interesting. Yeah, well, there's probably no sandwich more dear to the hearts of Americans <laughs> than the hamburger, and a lot of them will be eaten today, which is National Hamburger Day. Every year, we eat more than 50 billion, and almost half of all sandwiches are eaten in the United States. A lot of people may have just had a burger feast on Memorial Day. Well, good thing there are lots of ways to customize a burger. You can add almost anything to it, from blue cheese to a fried egg to peanut butter. There's some controversy over who invented the burger, but the consensus is it's been around since the late 19th or early 20th century. And yes, it's just given me another excuse to get a burger for dinner. I know. I was thinking the same thing. Now that it's supper time, <laughs> I'm, my stomach's growling. <laughs> Celebrate National yes. Burger Day. Oh. Let's, yes. Let's take a live look outside with live cam. It seems pretty quiet out there right now, Adam. What's, what's the latest? Yeah, Caskey just gave a thumbs down to National Burger Day. I'm having a cheesesteak. Oh, okay. oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> cheesesteak day to me. That's what I'm calling it. All right. Yeah, it is looking better outside in San Antonio. Just a few lingering light showers left over. Our storm threat has come to a close for the night. That's the nice thing off to the west, closer to the border. Maverick County, Western Maverick County and Kinney County is still a little bit of activity that's strong moving into Mexico right now. But for the most part, our storm threat has really fallen off, and I think we're going to be generally in the clear the rest of the night from any severe weather. We'll talk more about the forecast. We'll have Katie Blake here with another update in a few minutes. It has certainly been a very busy past few days. Just when you think it's over, it's not over. You know, a lot of us are relieved because yeah. it kind of broke apart over San Antonio. I think our weather department is relieved because I don't know, another long night. <laughs> well, you were on three hours last night. Is that what it was, four hours? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> something like that. That yeah. wasn't counting. It was, yeah. Um, but, yes, and, and our pattern is quieting down. That's the nice thing, too. Uh, we're getting into a different weather pattern that's not going to be quite as active either. So this was good. This is good that we're seeing it quiet down. All right, taking a look at the radar right now. We're looking off to the west, Maverick County, and that's where we have really the last lingering strong storm out there. And that's moving into Mexico as we speak, and we're seeing the activity really 
overall come to an end and diminish and start to fall apart. Looking at the lightning, these little lines are those lightning bolts within it, not as much lightning associated with it. You get into San Antonio and the thunderstorm that moved in was briefly severe and did drop over an inch of rain measured in Holotus, and we even had about an inch of rain measured in Timberwood Park. It had some good rain, but otherwise it has fallen apart and now just a few little sprinkles left over. Looking at the six hour rainfall totals, this is uh, pretty significant. You see that narrow swath right here through Holotus, Gray Forest area into Holotus, and right near Timberwood Park. Those are the higher rainfall accumulations that were within these more recent downpours. And remember, some of this is on the aquifer recharge zone. It's still soaking up the water from the recent rainfalls, and now we just added a little bit more to it. Even you cross over into Kamal County and Kendall County, not as much, a few hundredths of an inch. But what really stands out is when we get up farther to the northwest into Gillespie County and Kerr counties. This is where the storms really started and flared up. And they slowed down and spent a lot of time here. In turn, we're looking at radar estimates on the order of five to six inches just southwest of Fredericksburg due to that heavy rainfall. Even the Kerrville area, this is why they had flash flooding and are still under a flash flood warning until about 8 p.m. But otherwise, nothing to speak of right now in terms of the actual severe weather that's around town. But looking at some of these reports that we had, I mean, Kerrville, 1.5 inches in diameter reported earlier this afternoon in Kerrville. That's all we have on the radar screen right now. Let's go over to Katie Blake for a look at uh, what's to come here. We're quiet the rest of the evening, Katie. That's the nice thing. That's the reassurance. Let's talk about what we can expect in the hours and days ahead. Yeah, a little bit of break, uh, a break in this active weather pattern will be settling in as we head into the weekend. So that is the good news. This forecast model doing a good job of picking up on that leftover activity heading out of San Antonio and that stronger activity off to the west. As we get into the next few hours, everything will continue to drop south and east. We'll be left with a little bit of cloud cover and I can't rule out a lingering bit of rain, maybe even a few flashes of lightning for the next couple of hours. But certainly once we get past midnight into the pre-dawn hours of tomorrow morning, things will be quiet. However, the past couple of nights we have seen some little redevelopment during the overnight hours. I can't rule out some isolated showers tonight, but for the most part, quiet. And like Adam has been saying, the severe weather threat for San Antonio has passed. Looking at your day tomorrow, starting off with some clouds in the morning. It'll be sunny and quite warm in the afternoon with highs in the low 90s. But notice our wind direction north northeast. That is going to help to drop our humidity down a bit. So while it will be a bit toasty in the time at times in the afternoon, it's not going to be too muggy or uncomfortable out there. And we're going to keep your rain and thunderstorm free all the way through the weekend. Early next week, some low end chances of showers work back into the forecast and overall, even through the back half of next week, not too hot out there. So a nice little break in this active weather pattern settling in after tonight. Guys, thank you, Katie. In case you missed it coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. A family's home reduced to ash and rubble after a massive fire destroyed everything in its path early this morning. Firefighters tell me that, that by the time they arrived on the scene, flames had quickly taken over the home. Battalion Chief Javier Esparza for Bear County District 5 says no one was inside the home during the fire as the property is undergoing renovations and the family is staying in a different location. No injuries to report this morning, only substantial damage to the home, including a vehicle vehicle towards the front of the property and a tin roof in the back property that seems to have fully collapsed. Morgan's Wonderland, the San Antonio theme park designed to bring together people with and without special needs, will remain closed through 2020 due to the coronavirus pandemic. According to a news release, the closure also extends to Morgan's Inspiration Island Splash Park. The park was supposed to celebrate its 10th anniversary this year. Instead, the staff is looking for creative ideas to continue engaging the community. The Bear County Sheriff's office now honoring deputies who died in the line of duty. The fallen deputy memorial took place virtually. It was live streamed on BCSO's Facebook page. Eagle One from the San Antonio Police Department did a flyover toward the end of that ceremony. The BCSO Honor Guard also fired volleys to pay respect to the fallen. Some brand new cubs at uh, the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C. finally have names. The zoo recently asked the public to help name the litter of four cheetah cubs. One of the cubs is called Arendi, named after a South African cheetah reserve. 
His brothers are named Jabari and Hassani. Finally, the only girl was given the name Amabala, which appropriately means spots. Hello, Adam Kasky here back in the Weather Center and it is Thermometer Thursday. Our storm threat has come to an end and I do have one thing I want to announce really quickly. After what we've been through the past several days, it's time we do a little rubble to relic again. So this is what we did after the tornadoes. What was that five years ago? I believe the Linda Drive one and Alamo Heights and whatnot. And this is where um, we can take some damage, usually tree damage, and I can work it over and do the woodworking then make a thermometer from scratch and put it on there. You just have to have the right piece and whatnot. We have to make sure it'll work. But if you do have some kind of damage, I even took a fence post once and made something out of it. Anyway, contact thermometer at ksat.com. Again, send your email with a photo, a little description, your location, thermometer at ksat.com, because I like to try to at least take one positive out of the uh, nastiness that has come through. I want to see people challenge you. I want to see like like I want them to come up with stuff that they want you to make into a thermometer. Thanks, Steve. Like a gutter. <laughs> like a gutter. Yeah, we he, could. He could do it. Could I know he I could. That's what I said. I want to see a challenge here. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thanks for watching the news. See you online at nine and on the night beat at ten.